So I, I have a dream. Um, Tuesdays is my day in the cath lab, and I spend Tuesday morning closing ASDs, and I want to spend Tuesday afternoon opening them. <laughs> and you'll see the reason for that. There'll be an age difference in the morning and the afternoon patients. Actually, my real dream is to only work on Tuesdays, but <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. So as, as Levi said, I'm going to talk about a product that isn't available outside the context of a clinical trial. Um, John Hunter is a site of the clinical trial, St Vincent's, Concord, Prince Alfred. Uh, but this is a device that I've had a little bit to do with over the last few years. So we haven't had a talk today on diastolic heart failure, and most of this audience will be, uh, will be very well aware of the following three facts, that actually there's as much diastolic heart failure in the community as systolic heart failure. It's, it seems to be seen a little more outside the main teaching hospitals, but community prevalence rates are equal. Um, but in five years, it'll be more dramatic that the DHF epidemiology is such that diastolic heart failure or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which are the same thing, is becoming more frequent, whereas systolic heart failure is staying the same. And diastolic heart failure has more hospitalisation. So it's increasingly burdensome. And what surprises a lot of people is that the outlook is the same. So if you have clinical heart failure, it doesn't matter whether your ejection fraction is 60% or 30%, your outcome is the same. Um, now, the really disappointing thing about HEFPEF uh, or diastolic heart failure is the number of drug trials that have been done and which have had neutral results. So lots, lots been tried, lot has failed, so we're left with diuretics. And if you compare the therapeutic armamentarium in systolic heart failure on the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see that just tons of stuff has been proven. There are clinical trials behind all of these except diuretics. And tons of devices. We heard from John about VADs. We haven't heard too much about CRT, but that's well known to this audience. Whereas in diastolic heart failure, there's just, sadly for our patients, there's nothing to offer them on either the drug or the device front. And so that's where this device that's being trialled comes in, and it plays, it doesn't attack the underlying cause, which is the fibrosis or the amyloid that Greg and, and Gemma spoke about this morning, it's that increased LV stiffness always leads to elevated LA pressure, and it's the elevated LA pressure that brings people in in pulmonary edema in the middle of the night, that causes their hospitalizations, that causes their symptoms on exertion, and that leads to their premature mortality. And so the hypothesis behind this device um, is that if one were to create a very small atrial septal defect, you would lower LA pressure at rest and during exercise and hence reduce symptoms in patients with HEFPEF. So it's acting, given that high LA pressure is the problem, it's a blow-off valve for the LA. So you're trading an LA pressure problem for an RV volume problem because there'll be more blood shunting left to right, but that RV volume problem is very well tolerated by the normal heart. And as you know, we never close an ASD with a QP to QS of over 1.5 because you don't need to, because the right ventricle can cope with that very easily. And the aim of this device is to create a QP to QS of about 1.3, which goes up with exercise. So the interatrial shunt device is a transcatheter implant. Um, I think Darren's done a few, and I know that the, uh, the time once you've got into the femoral vein of delivering this is about seven minutes is the average at the moment. So it's a transcatheter implant to create a small permanent interatrial shunt and the shunt is designed to allow blood to pass from the higher pressure LA to the lower pressure, more compliant right side, reducing LA pressure. That's what the device looks like, and that's what it looks like in one of the early iterations in an animal implant. So what does this do? Well, interestingly, you can see on this slide, in someone in a normal heart, the LA pressure is a little higher than the RA pressure because the LV wall is thicker than the RV wall. And on exercise, you get this dramatic increase in LA pressure, which is higher, obviously, in people with HEFPEF. And if you make a little shunt, you get equalizations of these pressures. And for the same exercise, the RA pressure might be a fraction higher, but the LA pressure is a lot lower. So the idea is if you had one of these shunt in place, you'd be able to walk around without getting breathless because your wedge pressure or your LA pressure would stay below 20. That's what it looks like on an MRI. You can see the big high pressure left atrium and here's the right atrium. Here's the device and a little bit of flow across it. And the first in man data were published by Gerd Hassenfuss and colleagues in The Lancet uh, nearly two years ago now. And this was a primary safety trial, but there were effectiveness data there as well. 
and uh, much to everyone's relief, the MACE rate um, of everything was zero at six months. It was a very safe implant, and in fact, the two-year data are, are equally encouraging. And this is a slightly busy slide, and I'll skip over it quickly in the interests of time, but suffice it to say that what the device achieved was a slight rise, a rise in cardiac output and a fall in wedge pressure, which is kind of exactly what you'd really like if you were a patient with this condition. The NYHA class tended to improve. This is a questionnaire that's designed for use in patients with heart failure called the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure Questionnaire, and a lower score is a better quality of life. Uh, Six-minute walk distance went up and exercise time went up in this six-month preliminary data on 65 patients. Um, the new data I just wanted to share with you briefly today, which was just presented at the AHA uh, two months ago, is a nice study. Um, actually, the, the talk I'd really love to give at this meeting is about how to develop a new device, because it's a pain. Um, the, the, no, appropriately, the regulatory frameworks are amazing, but now the FDA, uh, after the simplicity trial of the renal denervation program, uh, you have to do a sham control on each device. And that's a very hard sell to patients, but that's what the FDA insists on. So this is a 22 sham operated and 22 septal device, and the patient doesn't know which they're getting. And this was simply a one-month hemodynamic study looking at their wedge pressure at rest, at legs up, at 20 watts of exercise and at peak exercise. And what you can see is that there was a substantial and significant reduction in their wedge pressure in, if they were in the non-sham or the septal defect group. And um, again, there were no adverse events at all in the IASD group in that middle column there, just um, one renal event in the control group. And that was published by uh, Ted Feldman and Sanjeev Shah in circulation uh, in late November for any people who'd like a little more information about that. So I've just given a very brief introduction to a, a, bar a therapeutically barren area with the very counterintuitive idea of making a hole in the heart. But it's not that counterintuitive. We all know that people with mitral stenosis who happen to have an atrial septal defect live for longer because they have their LA pressure blown off by the ASD. That's something called luton bacter syndrome. And we all know that people who have got a single ventricle heart who have a Fontan procedure do better if you leave a little ASD to allow their right atrium to blow off. And people with severe pulmonary hypertension in right heart failure can also benefit from a little atrial septal defect to create a right to left shunt and relieve the load on the right ventricle. So it's not a totally novel idea in this sense, it's just novel to use it in HEFPEF. So HEFPEF has no proven effective treatments. This interatrial septal device may be a novel solution to reduce LA pressure symptoms and events in this growing population. If you have patients with HEFPEF that there's nothing for, send them to Chris Hayward at St Vincent's, Sanjay Patel at Prince Alfred Hospital or to Rowan at John Hunter Hospital and uh, because they can go in the pivotal FDA trial which started enrolling last October. Thank you.